Have you been scrolling through many, many, many film podcasts thinking there's far too many of these? Or have you been thinking there's something missing? There's something we're not quite getting. A waffler from Northern England reviewing films, for example. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. No politics, no pandering, no point. You ever stick a film on and think, oh yeah, I'll watch this. I don't remember it much. I remember it being pretty good. I bought it on DVD. It was pretty scary. Oh, I'll watch this on Halloween's Eve. It'll be fine. Won't freak me out. What an idiot. That's me up all night. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. This is a review of The Woman in Black. Uh, the 2012 version that came out in 2012. (laughs) Um, There was an earlier one, I think, for the BBC, about 1976, if I remember rightly. Might give that a go. And this version of The Woman in Black was directed by James Watkins. It's starring Daniel Radcliffe, Kieran Hines, and a few other British actors that that you you recognise the faces of. I can't remember the names off the top of my head. And I should have researched them. I've just read the trivia and things. And this was Daniel Radcliffe's first film after the Harry Potter front. I'll speak to you that. Daniel Radcliffe's first film after the Harry Potter franchise. So it was it was a big deal for him, really. In that, you know, it could make or break it. it, it I remember uh, Tom Felton, the guy who played Draco Malfoy. Malf- God, what's my only today? Draco Malfoy in the Harry Potter films, and when he made his first film uh, after Harry Potter, I can't remember if it was, but I'm sure it was Planet of the Apes, the remake, you know, with James Franco, I'm sure it was. That was certainly one of his first ones anyway, and he said something in, in an interview for that film that I saw where he said, my agent pretty much said to me, you know, if, if you don't make it in the first three films, if they don't make an impact, then it's pretty much all over for you, which sounds quite harsh, but... I suppose that's probably the reality of, of the filmmaking industry, that if you're in something so big, such a big franchise, a massive franchise like that, especially as a child, and then you come out the other side other side of it as an adult and you try and push into adult films, if you don't make it in the first few films, you know, people, agents and things are probably, uh, casting directors will probably think, no, he's not as that, he's typecast, he's not going to be able to go any further. And you get the feeling, I get the feeling, my own personal uh, not position, opinion is that um, this is probably what it was like for Daniel Radcliffe. He chose something very, and he, he's continued to do this since, to his credit. He's chosen things far and away from Harry Potter. He did that here. He's chosen to do a film that's set in the early 20th century. It could be Vict- late Victorian or most likely to be a Victorian, t- uh, not Victorian, Edwardian times. But they don't actually put a uh, they never pin down a date in the film. You know, you never see a newspaper and no one ever mentions the date. Uh, so basically the film starts and there's three little girls and you can tell it's like Edwardian because the way they're dressed. They're in like an old-fashioned nursery. Well, it'd be modern at that point anyway. And they're kind of playing dollies and these beautiful old porcelain dolls and they're playing tea party with these little porcelain teapots and things. And then all of a sudden, they just all stand up, the three three girls, the three sisters. They drop the teapots and the dolls, kind of as if they're possessed. They walk slowly towards this strangely kind of three-tiered window, three-panelled window, and stand, smash the teapot, smashes on the floor. They stand and smash the head of a doll, walk to the window. They each open a window each and jump out. And you hear, you don't hear them hit the ground, which I thought was a nice touch. That sounded strange. I just meant they could have had this awful thud noise, but they don't. They have no noise. They just have presumably, presumably the mum screaming, "Oh my, you know my babies." And then it goes to the opening titles, and you kind of see a couple exchanging rings. And we presume this is uh, Arthur Kipps, played by Daniel Radcliffe. 
and his wife. And it fades to Daniel uh, Arthur Kipps, play by Dan- we know who he's played by, in front of a mirror. He's got a razor to his throat, one of those old fashioned razors. He's kind of got it to his throat as if he's going to hurt himself. And he hears and sees his wife behind him in the mirror and he turns and she's gone. And his kid shouts him and says, Daddy, you know, I need you to help me pack my suitcase. And he pa- Arthur's packing his suitcase and you see he's got all these overdue bills in, in his suitcase. And you can see that he's just gen- generally disconnected. He's trying his best with his kid and his nanny's there and he's, he's trying his best, but he's grief stricken. And I will say this for Daniel Radcliffe. He does a lot in this film. He acts very much with his face. There's, it, I'd love to count how many words he actually says in this film because it's not an awful lot. If it's more than a hundred, I'd be surprised. It's He doesn't talk belly at all. It is very silent movie-esque at times, which means even more so that it, the film hangs on on Daniel Radcliffe's performance and he's magnificent. If there's anybody who thought he couldn't act, you know, I was just in Harry Potter and he flew around on brooms and this, that and the other. And he, he, he but he won't act properly. Oh, he, you know, he, he shut those people up. That's for sure with this, with this performance. And then you see, um, this is what I mean about my writing. Absolutely awful. What am I even, what is he even, what's that even say? Oh, yeah. Uh, so his son, he's, his son who's about seven, I think, has drawn this little kind of flip book and it's got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on it. And he says, look, I'm, and it's Tuesday, I think. And Arthur says to his son, look, we'll be together again in, you know, three days on Friday. I'll meet you on the train station and we'll go like to the beach. They're going to go away on like a, on holiday to the seaside somewhere. And the son has, has drawn him, the nanny, obviously himself as a little boy, and then there's there's mammy in heaven as an angel on a cloud. But everybody else is happy, but his dad's face is like a, got a sad face. And he says, why have you drawn me sad? And the kid, obviously, as kids do, they, they don't sugarcoat it. He just says, well, that's what your face looks like. And he's not wrong. Daniel Radcliffe does look pretty miserable in this throughout. But obviously, that's his character. That's the way his character's feeling. And the nanny says, oh, you know, we'll, we'll see you Friday. And he ventures out into the streets, obviously on his way to his work. And the streets are very smoky. I mean, I've no doubt they did that. I mean, to, to, number one, be realistic to the, to the Edwardian times. Nearly said Victorian. Um, and that the, uh, to try and cover up, not cover up, make best use of the limitations. You know, this film got lottery funding from the the fil- uh, from the British Film Council and that kind of thing. So it, it's not like it had a huge, huge budget. So they're cleverly using the historical aspect of the smoke to, to cover up the limitations. It looks like it was filmed. And this isn't a bad thing. It looks like it was filmed at a kind of, if you've got one near you, kind of a, a living country museum kind of like where they film Repair Shop on BBC or a place like Beamish or somewhere like that that has like a Victorian street, that kind of thing. And I know it said Wadian, but... And it, it, so it looks so... It's filmed in a certain way that it never shows you a, a massive amount. It never shows you like... It's not like big budget where it shows you a whole street with cars and this, that and the other. It very cleverly makes use of what it's got. Which, which is good because it means there's not a lot for it. There's nowhere to hide for the for the actor's performances, for the, the writing. It, it's like an old, a very, in, in the best way possible, it's like a very old-fashioned film in that everything hangs upon the performances because they don't have CGI, they don't have monsters, they don't have gore, that kind of thing. Anyway, to kick on with the story. You see Kip, Arthur Kipps goes to, goes to his office. He's, he's a solicitor. And his boss, who's played by, his name's gone. He's been in all sorts. He was in a film I watched that long. Anyway, 
the boss says to him, look, we can't carry passengers, Kips. I know you've been through a lot, but, you know, we need to get on and done. Because, you know, there's there's no there's no benefits. There's no, uh, what do they call it now? Compassionate leave. There's nothing like that. So if you don't go to work, you don't get money and you end up, you know, you lose everything. So, and his boss says to him, look, you need to go to Eel Marsh House. Um, an old widow's died. She's got, and Arthur says, no family. He says, well, she had a boy, died young. And his boss basically says, look, you're going to have to, he does, he says, you're going to have to go out and prove yourself, show that you're still willing to do this job and you're, you're still valuable to this company because we, we can't just, we can't carry anyone along for free. Everyone needs to earn their keep. And he says, there's a local man, Jerome, he's not being cooperating, but you need to go out there and find her final will. Make sure we've got, and, and go through the house because there's loads of paperwork. And you see Arthur on the train. He's kind of falling asleep. And he sees this article by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, or um, endorsed by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, obviously, who wrote Sherlock Holmes. I meant to say it, obviously, there, by the way. I'm there. So, and you can see he's kind of weighing it up. Does he believe it, doesn't he? But like I said, he... A lot of this is done with his eyes. He, he doesn't talk very much. He's not a particularly talkative person. I mean, maybe he was before his wife passed on. And, but you see a flashback and he's waiting outside the door. He's younger. He looks happier and uh, fuller in the face. And he hears, his, he hears his wife screaming. And you presume she's in labor, by the way, he's pacing outside the door. Because in those days, I don't think the men would have gone in unless the, the man was a doctor anyway. And you see a flashback. The doctor comes out. The nanny's there. The doctor comes out as well and says, it's a boy. And then he says, I'm very sorry, Mr. Kipps. And he stands aside and you see that his wife's white face and his wife's bled out during pregnancy. And you see like the blood on the bed. But like I said, it's realistic. It's not gory. It's anyway. So he wakes up on the train and Kieran Hines, the actors sat opposite him. And he plays Samuel Daly. And he says, saw you from London. And Kipps explains, yeah, that have we reached the station yet? He says, no, we're not there yet. It's the next stop. And he said, oh, I can give you, I'm Arthur, I'm Samuel Daly. And he introduced himself to Arthur Kipps. He says, you're not going to find a local buyer for that house. And Samuel Daly says, oh, I can give you a lift. And Samuel Daly says, oh, I've got, you know, one of the first cars in the country. I think he says the first car in the country. And he says, you know, the car still scares the locals. He invites Arthur for tea, I think, the next night. It's absolutely pouring it down. He gets there late. He gets to the hotel, like a boarding house. And he says, oh, I've got a room booked under Mr. Kipps. And the innkeeper, who's a, a British actor, he's in bloody everything. Great actor, but I can't remember his name either. So apologies to him. And he says, no, I'm sorry, we're packed with the rafters. There's nothing available. Um, except the attic, because the the um, his wife, the, the the innkeeper's wife, she's very much trying to help Arthur, but the husband's like, no, he's he's not staying here. And then the innkeeper's wife takes him into the attic and says, look, you're better off inland for a holiday, because he explains his son's coming to meet him, and he gets put in the attic, and then you see it's the same room as at the beginning, where the little girls were and Arthur sees some pictures so those daughters were the innkeeper and the innkeeper's wife wife's kids and you you started to see a little bit why the innkeeper was so what's the word like not, not suspicious but so unwelcoming and wanting to get rid of him but you don't understand why and the headless one of the headless dolls is on the side but obviously it wasn't headless but when they stood on it and you know, there's Arthur walks to the window and you think, oh, is he going to, is he possessed? Is he going to jump out? But he just shuts the curtains. So that's, the film makes good use of tension. And then Arthur walks up the street and all these, he sees these couple of little boys and little girls in like a front, in like a front, uh, not a garden, but like in front of a house, down some steps and the dad, the big, oh, what's the guy's name? He's a big bloke, big broad bloke. He says to the kids, you know, get in. And all the kids, you see kids looking at him from the windows. They've all been locked away. 
and you're trying to figure out why. And he goes to H. Jerome. It's his initial H. Jerome. He's the solicitor. And like I said before, the filming locations are beautiful. And he meets Mrs. Jerome. And Jerome says to him, there's no need for you to come. There's no need for you to come. I've got all the paperwork here. Um, the Barden house is booked all week. I've got your train ticket ready. My man is outside for you to go jump on. He'll take it to the station. You'll be fine. See you later, mate. Turns around and off you go. And he pretty much shuts the door on his face. And they're, they're trying to usher him away. I mean, very, very quickly. Oh, there's no phone. There's no telegram on a Wednesday. The hotel's fully booked. Off you go. And he says the... Oh, what is the guy's name? I've written it down later. We'll come away. He says to the guy outside with the, the horse and cart, he says, look, uh, take me to this Eel Marsh house. I need to go. And he says, six shillings. And he's like, six shillings, which is a hell of a lot of money then, to to go to go to the house. And the, the guy says to him, well, you'll not find anyone local to take you there. So they set off for Eel Marsh. He gives him the six shillings begrudgingly. But then again, there's not a lot of talking. He, he, there's no argument or anything like that. It's they're very dignified and refined. Refined? Not refined. Whatever. Um and Eel Marsh House is off the mainland across a causeway. So that's like a strip of uh, of uh, God, not walkway. Well a walkway or a I was gonna say a road, but it wouldn't be a road, but a route path you could get across when the tide's out. At low tide, but when the tide's at high tide, it covers over completely by the sea. You can't get there, and you cut off. A little bit like Holy Island. They, the on the way over there, they pass a, a cross in the sand, presumably for where somebody's died. And he says to the to the man, "Oh, can you come and get me at three? And the guy says, "No, I can't. I'll come for you at five because that's when the tide lowers." So you see Arthur Kipps, he walks through the woods, he walks past this old cemetery, and everything's like dilapidated. And the the there's this like creepy music by a violin. It's got crows are cawing and but he just walks, it's kind of very atmospheric. He gets to this dilapidated house, there's ivy all over it, leaves everywhere, vines all over it. It looks like it's been empty for years, but the woman's only just died. And you see a shape behind him and a, and a whisper, but you don't know what it is. He walks through the house and this monkey water falls out of the tap. That's a bit of a jump. And then he, he opens the shutters, these wooden shutters, and let, let the light in. And inside the house isn't too bad. It doesn't look anywhere near as bad as outside. And you see these three monkeys. So they're the, is it? See no evil, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Those three monkeys, but they're kind of stuffed. There's tons of papers everywhere, which his boss said, so he's going to have to go through them. You see the causeway disappear under the high tide. It's very misty. Then he sees uh, through the paperwork that Nathaniel and her little boy drowned when he was seven. The body wasn't recovered. He, he sees the death certificate. They don't seem to have changed a lot. The um, the birth and death certificates look exactly the same as the ones you get now. I'm going for the birth certificate one. And he looks through these cards that the mum's written for the son. Happy birthday, son. He hears footsteps up, upstairs. Quiet, echoing screams. There's like a jingle of a child's toy. Someone coughing. The sound is superb. The, there's footsteps doors a lock it's very visceral but it's not done in any over the top way at all the music's very foreboding arthur goes up checks the upstairs rooms he sees there's a bird's nest in like one of the fireplaces and a hatchling's far out of it so he picks it up puts it back in then a crow flies in dead loudly and makes it you know that makes you jump he opens the window to let the the bird out and because it's like smashed through one of the panes of glass and he sees a woman in black in the cemetery and the crow calls and he looks away at it and then he looks back and she's gone so he goes outside to check you know dusk it's dusk now you know dark's falling in quick 
because obviously there's no lights or anything like that. And he he goes out to try and see to find her. He ends up on like the beach. It's really misty. He thinks he hears a horse neighing. He thinks he's heard an accident. He hears screaming. He hears someone running. He hears a woman screaming, Nathaniel. You know, this a kid's drowning. The beach is completely in fog. And then he turns and then he sees Kepwick. That's the guy's name that the guy who dropped him off on the cart. Kepwick stood there with his horse. He goes to, then he goes to the police station. You see him in the police station. He tries to report to the police. Look, I've heard an accident. And he says to the constable, look, I've seen a woman. I saw a woman on the, on, I saw a woman there. It's not deserted, the island. And the constable's like, hang on, I'll just go and talk to my, you know, my superior. And he goes off. And then the two little boys, I think, are it two, the, the little kids he saw earlier, including the little girl that were ushered in by their dad, they turn up and the middle girl's really pale. She looks really ill. And they say, oh, you know, help. We need help. She drank some lye, which is, can be fatal if it's ingested. And the little girl coughs up blood and collapses into Kips's arms. And he just shouts, constable, constable. And then you see him outside and he's on the verge of tears. You can see it in his eyes. Obviously, this was a time when I doubt it was seen as respectable if a man cried in public. But like I said, I'm only going off the limited history I've got. I'm not massively on social history. Anyway, and the the little girls died. You hear the mum screaming, which is horrible. The dad carries her out. And like I said before, the film's quite old-fashioned. There's no jump scares in it. There's no massive, there's no cheap gore. It, the fear comes from the tension, the emotions, the performances, the situation. He goes back to his hotel. He hears Mrs. Mrs. Fisher crying. That's the innkeeper's wife. And it turns out to be a, um, I thought it was a parrot, but reading the trivia, it's not. It's a bird that can also ape human noises, human sounds. Because it's not just parrots that can do that. And it turned out to be the bird aping her crying. So you know she's been crying a lot. And Mrs. Fisher and Kips share some spirits. As in drinking spirits, not like ghost spirits. And she says, you know, you'll miss your London train. She says, don't go back to Eel House, Mr. Kipps. You've got your son. Go and get him. Cherish him. Go home. And I've I've got down that it's not sensationalised at all, this film. It's not, doesn't, which is good. It's very understated. It's very old-fashioned in the best possible way. Then he sees Mr. Daly and because he's going for tea and the son turns out his son Nicholas Daly um, died and he says look don't tell my wife don't mention children on my wife at all if you can help it then you see his wife and she's got these two little dogs sat on two little chairs she talks to them like the children they're like they're in little petticoats I don't know what dogs they are they're like little little dogs and He's the wealth. He's not. He's he's a very nice bloke, um, Mister Dilly. In this, he's not bragging. He just says, you know, we're the wealthiest folks in the country, and we've got no one to leave it to. And she see he sees that she's been drawing, and she saw. He says, "Oh, Nicholas loves to sketch too." Oh, sorry. So she says, "Nicholas, which is her son, loves to sketch too." He still does. And he wants to paint you a picture and the husband's like, no, no, come on. And she picks up a knife and she starts scratching the table and he shouts one of the housemaids, I think, and says, get the medication. And I think it's chloroform. They put a, I presume anyway, they put like a cloth over her face and she loses consciousness and he, he tries to calm it, you know, just to calm it down. because She's gone. What would they've called it then? Mania. And he says to Arthur, you know, she's convinced she, 
our son talks through her and he says, do you believe this spiritual spiritualism stuff? And Kip says, well, I didn't believe it until my wife died. No, I'm, I'm not so sure. And he says, sometimes I feel him in the room. And you, you, we've seen that earlier at the beginning. So we know where he's coming from. Whereas Sam Daly is very much like, look, it's charlatans. They prey on those in need. And you get the impression that he's been before. No, no, sorry, that he hasn't been before, sorry. Or oh, maybe he has. But Kips, I think, has because he says all oh, they do, you know, the worst thing they do is disappoint. And Sam says to him, look, look it's not natural to, to lose the young. You know, this spiritualism stuff, it's, it's chasing shadows. We go up there when we die. We don't stay down here. But this is what I meant by not sensationalist, that the way they talk is very natural to the to how it would have been at the time. They don't massively talk about it. It's more that, that is what's unsaid. They don't talk about emotions. They, they don't sit and cry. They don't weep. They talk about things, but it's more that in the places where they don't talk, what's unsaid, which would have been very like the time, I'd imagine. Then you see the wife later on, she's got the dogs in these little baby baskets. And Kip goes downstairs and looks at the diagram because he, he's staying with them now because he wouldn't they wouldn't have him at the hotel. Well, they said it was booked, but clearly not. And it's a hanging person. And he says, you know, Jerome won't help you much. And then they go looking for Mr. Jerome. And this in his uh, solicitor's office, he's not there, and neither is his wife. They see something moving under the floorboards in the cellar. So Kips goes down there. He looks through a peephole and sees some shadow fly across him. And then a, a girl's there looking at him, which made me jump. And she says, You killed Victoria Harding, which is the little girl who died from drinking lye accidentally earlier. Apparently, accidentally. And she says, Go, go. And Arthur comes out and he says, what? And he says to Sam, what's going on? Sam's outside with his car. He says, what is going on? And he says, complete nonsense. And as they try to drive away, there's the men from the village there, the innkeeper, the Victoria Harding's um, dad. And he says, he's crying and saying, you should have gone. You saw that woman at the house. And Sam's saying, look, this is ridiculous. It's just suspicion. It's all wives' tales. Be modern, essentially. And the innkeeper says, Mr. Fisher says to him, they took your boy as well. And he goes to get up and Arthur holds him back. And he says, fine, I'll take him to the station. Then he puts it in gear and drives straight at them. He says to Arthur, as they're driving over the causeway again, pay no attention to them. It's just an old place, Arthur, cut off from the world. And Arthur says, look, don't come back for me. I'd rather stay and work through the night. So he gives him the dog spider and says, look, have the spider, have the spider, have the dog spider, you know, just for company. Don't go chasing shadows, Arthur. And like I said about Daniel Radcliffe in this, he, playing Arthur Kipps, he's very morose. He's obviously depressed, but he's doing his damnedest to, to just get on with it and provide for his boy. And he get he gets back to the house He's trying, and this is where it, the tension that he's trying keys to the door and this tension builds and the shots of the long corridor behind him. And it's more, it, the fear comes from the expectation of what's coming. Sometimes the, you get a payoff and sometimes you don't. I can't imagine this would be a film that people who love a lot of jump scares, love a lot of gore, would enjoy it's much more of a well it's from a book it's from a you know the adaptation of a stage play so it's got that feel about it much more tight quarters more about the feel and he finds a chest under the bed it's Nath uh, nathaniel drablos the little boy then he sees a hand against the bathroom door panel window but there's no one there like a little the little kid's hand, he looks in, there's no one there. And he looks into one of those, you know, those shadow casters that you see in films that you put over a lamp 
and you spin it and it puts shadows around the room and he sees a girl's eyes behind him and he finds these notes scribbled saying be gone blessed god save me protect me a shadow goes past the window the dog barks and he goes outside again of course he does and there's a shadow goes across in front of the camera and when he walks out he looks back towards the house darkness is falling again and he sees a ghostly hand and face against the window in one of the upstairs rooms and the shots held it's not like one of those films where it shows you it quickly and then cuts to give you that shock it's it's held so that it keeps it's more the creepiness so he it looks at her as long as he's looking at her it doesn't show her the thing in the window quickly and then show him. It's not designed to make you jump. It's creepier. It's more the mystery of what, what the hell's going on. And he goes up there to where the face was. And you see the face behind him as he looks out of the window. And he, he finds cards from Mum to Nathaniel. Then he finds out through the through the paperwork that he's going through, that the lady who lived in the house, Jeanette, she was the boy's actual auntie and her and her husband adopted Nathaniel from her sister because her sister was mentally unstable. And a uh, uh, sister, uh, Jeanette Hunfryer. So they adopted him. Oh no, sorry, Janet. Janet was the sister uh, who was mentally unstable, who was, it was her son. Alice and her husband, that was her sister and her husband, adopted Nathaniel. And you see all these really, and they get more and more, as she's getting more and more mentally deranged, they get more and more scribbly. All these letters saying, he is mine, I'll find a way to see him. You see a picture of Alice and her husband in front of the house, which Arthur's seen before. And he looks in one of the windows and she's there in the picture. And the, the scrawls for the letters get more and more kind of demented you didn't even try after the boy had died that you didn't even try and save him i'll never forgive you rot in hell then you find out that she jeanette the the the, the, the real mother she hung herself in the nursery of the house the door bangs open behind him and a woman in black slowly walks towards him as he because he's fallen asleep looking at these the dog snarls, a hand reaches out in shadow. You can see the shadow on his back. The dog barks, he wakes up, there's no one behind him. But then he looks down at the picture of Alice and her husband and the eyes have been scratched out as if with a knife. Obviously, he's the only one there. By who? Who's done that? Then there's this rhythmic banging from upstairs, kind of like a rocking horse. And it gets faster and faster. And he goes, he goes upstairs. And the tension building is brilliant. And he's got, a, he has to take a candle down. He's walking with a candle. And fair play to the, the lighting in this film. Some, some series or films you watch where they go for that naturalistic lighting that there would have been at the time. For example, Wolf Hall, the TV adaptation that was on BBC a few years ago. That was so dark. It was like off putting that you struggled to see anything. Now, I get that was more realistic. But if it's so realistic, but you can't bloody see anything. And it ruins the the entertainment for you. What's the point? And he's anyway. He gets up to the door to the nursery. The door's locked, so he goes downstairs. Get gets this axe. Comes back upstairs. The door's wide open. And he's a lot braver than me. I'd be running. I'd be running. You see the rocking chair, and you see her in it briefly. And you can see his face now. It, he's unnerved. And. As I've said before, it's almost like a silent movie at times. He talks very little. I mean, why would you? You're on your own. It's not in his character to talk to the dog either. You know, then the chair just suddenly slows down and stops. In the nursery, he sees under the he sees under this wallpaper, which has got like letters all over it, something written. He rips the wallpaper off. It's the same wallpaper underneath with this red scrawl over it and it cuts between him and the eyes of this toy and it, it's very well cut together 
as he's ripping it down and then it's revealed it says you could have saved him then this toy monkey starts like shaking the instruments and all these vintage toys start going off and a bit of trivia all these vintage toys they were loaned by a collector they're actual antiques the it's shutting it down outside it's raining obviously it's, it's darkness again you see the cross he looks out the window and he sees the shadow of a boy rise from the mud and walk towards the house and on the glass there's a handprint on it and he puts his hand over the handprint and a woman screams in his face in the reflection of the glass and someone's knocking on the door and rattling the door handle so he goes downstairs and he's like who's there the rattling stops he grabs the door handle the rattling starts to go mad again someone pounding trying to get in he rips the door open there's thunder there's lightning there's rain he goes out into the down the steps looking around he sees the three little girls from the start uh, the, the innkeeper's dot innkeeper's kids the girl who swallowed the lie he sees a little boy covered in mud he sees another oh no he doesn't see a little boy covered in mud sorry he sees a little boy who's presumably sam daly's son lit by the lightning and he's really unnerved he shoot, he goes back in the house quick locks the door and he sees like a muddy child's footprints going up the stairs and he hears this child's music box singing and the footsteps lead to the nursery then he sees that he takes the candle in one hand he's got the axe in the other he sees that furniture has been knocked over this clown's moving and playing this little clown toy and then something scarp has passed him and a woman drops from a noose from the ceiling and she's hanging there and the, she disappears in the rocking chair rock so that's where that comes from then he is is he drops his candle his candle goes out he picks the candle up he's striking a match and as he lights the match and it catches and the light comes back there's a boy covered in mud like right next to his face snarls at him and that's a pretty good jump then he sees the woman in black he runs into a bedroom shuts the door and then the muddy boy starts to emerge from the bed he runs out the door runs to the front door and daily's there and it's it's in daylight the, the sun's risen he's in the car going back over at the mainland he says to he says to him you don't believe you know you don't believe me dear he says, look, the boy was lost in the marsh. They never found his body. He says, I and the writing's top notch. He says, I believe even the most rational men's minds can play tricks in the dark. Favourite line of the film. And they get back. The solicitors is on fire. And they're screaming at other girls in there. They've locked her under, under there to protect her. Lucy, so they're screaming for her. Arthur runs in. There's no fire service, so obviously that they're uh, they've got these buckets throwing water on the fire. He just darts in, but the whole place is on fire. He sees the little girl. The whole cellar's alight. He sees her stood there. She's holding an oil lamp, and he says, "I'll oh, stay there. Stay there. I'll come and get you." And in the corner, the woman in black's there. The little girl looks kind of like the little girl's at the beginning, kind of possessed, expressionless face. She doesn't blink. She drops the oil lamp and she, she just ignites in flames. The roof starts to collapse and he barely makes it out alive. Then it's kind of a slow motion. There's no noise. They're throwing buckets on the fire. The solicitor's crying. His wife's crying. Then you see Arthur back at uh, Sam's house and he's burnt his hands. And he tells Sam Daly she, she was there, Sam. She was right there. And like I said, again, with what's not said, you can see, you can see in Sam's face, play, played brilliantly by Kieran Hines, that he knows something's going on. He knows there's more. But he, he just says, look, you know, well, I don't think he says anything. It's just, you see the wife's drawn a new painting and it's a man and woman walking into the water. They're playing, uh, and he says, Arthur's outside, and he says to 
Sam's wife, what happened to his son? And she says they were playing at the beach and the tide caught them off guard. And the wife looks at him and she's like, you've seen her, haven't you? And she says, you mustn't blame yourself for not staying away from the house. She explains to him, however briefly she's seen afterwards, doesn't matter who she's seen by, how briefly she's seen, soon after in some violence or dreadful circumstance, a child has died. So many, many children, including her own son. And she says she makes us do it. They took her they took her boy away. So now she makes she she makes us she takes everybody else's children. And you see all the children in flashbacks who've been lost, kind of doing it to themselves, the two boys walking to the sea, which is what she drew, what she painted earlier. You see the little girl drinking the lie. And she, she starts to go into a mania again. She says, she's coming, she's coming. And her voice is different, sounds kind of possessed. And Sam hears her voice and she collapses. And she's drawn a train with a, a man and his son. And then you have the back in the car, Sam and Arthur. And Arthur says to him, how could you take me there? It's the, one of the most emotional parts, isn't it? He says, how could you take me there? Even if there was the most, the most remote possibility that this could happen, this could harm people, how could you take me there? And he says, well, what? How, how would you want me to... I didn't believe it. thought it was superstition. How could, you know... I, basically, how I want to believe my son's in a, a better place because if he's not, he's lost. What, you know, what would you choose to believe? And Arthur thinks maybe if we, we reunite her and her son... So they use the car, they anchor Arthur with a rope, they go to where the cross is, and he searches under, uh, Arthur searches under the mud, and he says, Sam, I feel it's just below my feet. And they're trying to haul this, something out of the water, and it looks like a cart that's gone under the water. He finds the kid's body, he says, I found the boy, and he's all covered in mud. It's, it, you don't see an awful lot, it's, it's not graphic or anything. The engines are overheating, and the carriage sinks back into the mud, but he's got the little boy back at the house. Sam says to him, Arthur, let's just put him in the ground. Let's just bury him. And Arthur says, no, there's something I've got to do ne- do first. They're lost. They need to find each other. So he puts the boy's body on the bed, wrapped up. You see the boy's little face. Um, in the, it's kept in shadow, though. And he puts the mum's letters all around. Rosary beads on top. And he says to him, you know, nearly time now. There's a shadow in the mirror. He turn, Arthur turns on all the rabbit toys, the monkey uh, the monkey toys, he's to signal her to come. Then Sam sees the shadow of his son and says, Nicholas. And he goes into this room. He hears Daddy. He sees his son on the other side of the door. The door slams shut. And there's a screaming face at the window. He shouts Arthur, but all the music upstairs from from all these uh, toys he's turned on has blotted out the his shouts. The chair starts rocking again upstairs. The lights go out as she approaches. She screams and shoots towards him. Then the door open. The, the door opens for Sam Daly. He goes upstairs and Arthur says, "I think she's gone." And they go to her grave. And it's like one of those ones with a concrete top. They split it. The Arthur drops into the... He opens the coffin. There's a skeleton there. He, he puts the child in with her. He closes the lid. They've reunited them. They drive away. They go back to the house. And he says out. And then you hear that... You hear her whispering. Saying, I'll never forgive you. I'll never forgive you. And you think, oh, will that have ended things? Will it have ended this kind of... These awful, dreadful things that have been happening. And you see Joseph and the nanny arrive at the station. First time you see Arthur smile. Sam smiles as well. Joseph introduces him to... Uh, sorry, he says, Joseph, this is Sam. And he says to his nanny, go get the tickets. We're going straight back to London. I want him home. So the nanny goes to the tickets. You hear this music. His son sees something and walks towards the platform. Let's go of his dad's hand, walks towards the platform. Sam's talking to uh, Arthur. They don't realise. Then the nanny turns around, sees the kid on the track. 
shouts. You don't hear this. It's again done with, with just music over the top. And he runs onto the track. You see the woman in, and then the train just hits hits them both. And Sam sees all the children. He sees the woman in black, and he sees all the kids. He sees all the kids that have died, like between the windows. And you're thinking, did she do it as revenge, or as a thank you? To reunite him with his family. The train hits them. Uh, the woman in black screams. He, you see him look down. He can barely move. He, like jelly legs. He walks across to the. He looks down. Then Arthur opens his eyes. They're on the station. But it's empty. He's like Sam. Sam. And he looks around. And then his kid who was in his arms says. Daddy. Who, who's that lady? And Arthur looks around and it's, it's his, he says, that's your mummy. So Arthur laughs. He takes his wife's hand as they, they walk away down the tracks into the smoke. Because he, you know, you see, you know, he, you see it in his face. He accepts, he realizes the dead, but he's happy because his, his family's back together again. Then the woman in black appears. She's watching. Then she looks straight at you, and the film ends there. So that was it was based on the novel by Susan Hill. It was also a stage play. I saw the stage play in the West End. I wasn't best pleased. But mind you, I was in school at the time. The first half was that boiling hot in the theatre. We were that far away. They made us sit with people who weren't our friends because that way we wouldn't talk. Stupid idea. So you were sat with people you'd never talk to anywhere. It was boiling hot. Seats were rubbish. And then... By the time the the second act got better, more creepier, by then you'd lost the story of it and you couldn't be bothered anyway. I would, I mean, maybe I'd probably enjoy it more now. But anyway, so the the son was played by Daniel Radcliffe's real godson and it was his suggestion so that they would be able to show that bond. It was a good idea because it does come across that they know each other. Because like I said with this film, a lot of it's said through the way people act. Not so much how they talk. There's, it was the biggest grossing British horror film in 20 years. The happy ending was added last minute as test audiences felt the ending. The original ending was the train hit them, the one in black stream, that was it. Felt that that was a bit too grim with them both dying. The film, as I said before, never pins down a date sometime in the early 20th century, 1910 possibly. It grossed $120 million worldwide. It was the most success. It At the time, I don't know if it still is, it was the most successful British horror film of all time. So it was a, a hell of a benchmark for Daniel Radcliffe to, to, to put down straight after finishing Harry Potter. And as we've seen from his films, he's continued to go on to make quite an eclectic mix of films. Can't say I've seen an awful lot of them but it is something I, I need to do but this, so happy Halloween I would definitely give this one a watch don't watch it if you're not great with ghosts that kind of thing, spirits my brother would hate this one hate it so if you're listening to this don't watch it so thank you once again for joining me if you can review this podcast on podchaser.com, I'd really appreciate it. Or on whichever streaming service you're listening on, if it's possible to leave a review. Thanks again for listening. And I'll be back soon with another review. Happy trick or treating. <laughs>